you know, hefty patients are just not as vocal, activated, and so a lot of the things that we, when I, that I see on the heavy listserv, people are saying, um, people don't realize, like, they, they, a lot of times the scientists don't realize how desperate for a cure and how badly people are waiting for a cure um, because they don't hear that directly. And so, I, Jordan and I and Happy Foundation said, we really need a place where patients can interact um, and learn about medical, you know, the medical updates, um, but also be activated so that they feel empowered to understand clinical trials and to say, hey, you know, drug company X, why aren't you including this patient group? Or why aren't you looking at patients who are immune tolerant? Or why aren't you looking at those of us who are in the carrier phase? You know, we, we want to get cured too, even though our viral load is low, we still think it's important um, to get cured. And you should include us in your clinical trials, not just look at the people with active disease. And this is a topic of discussion all the time. Who are the first line people who will get the cure? And a lot of times it's people with abnormal liver function tests and high viral load. Um, and they're not looking so much at the immune tolerant and the people who are in the carrier phase. Um, and so it's important. If we think that's important as patients, we should be pushing for that. Because um, what they're looking at is they want to know that there's demand too, right? Would you take that medicine? Would you pay for my medicine? Um, so it's important for our patients to say, yes, I want to be cured even though I'm only a carrier. Um, it's important for us to voice that. So, and many years ago, Happy Foundation had these patient conferences. Right, Tim, and you guys had sessions where patients were able, a lot of times they were parents of people, kids with hep B, and they said it was so useful to be able to have clinicians in the same room as doctors and to ask questions. And I honestly had not seen that done ever before, so I'm totally going on you guys. Um, and so I said, okay, well, let's do this. Let's have a panel, hepatologist, uh, primary care doctor. Ideally, you know, it would have been great to have an infectious disease doctor, because IV doctors also treat hep B. Um, and just have a chance to kind of go over, um, you know, basic, there are all these different uh, best practices, and then um, talk about it. I mean, and, uh, Dr. Persopoulos is also the director of the liver transplant program um, at New Jersey Medical School, and he obviously sees a lot of other liver disease, not just hep B, and he sees the end stage of what we're trying to avoid um, with transplant, and, and, and when we have patients that are really severe, we, you know, we'll send him, uh, we'll send them over for uh, complex disease. And the other thing he's an expert in is fatty liver, which is you know the number one rising um, condition in the US, and it makes treating Hep B very confusing, actually. So with that in mind, you guys you know, write some questions. Gene will collect them. I'm gonna start, you know, just I'm just gonna show the slide. I mean, we know normal liver, cirrhosis, liver cancer, what we're trying to avoid. Um, and I think we've kind of talked about this that Oh, everybody with surface antigen positive needs to see a doctor, no matter if you feel well, and even if your viral load is undetectable, you still need to see the doctor six months um, to a year. And we just had this discussion in this room about carrier, what that term means, and how it's over, often overused, and if you have surface antigen, you have the infection, you have the infection. Um, if you happen to have low viral load and normal ALT, you might be in the carrier state, but people fluctuate in and out of that. Um, and people with cirrhosis have really low viral loads, right? So you can't go by viral load sometimes, um, you know, just to look at, uh, you know, somebody's condition. But there are meds. Um, these are the labs which we had talked about. There are even, there's a push for primary care doctors to do more because we know that a lot of people can't access hepatologists um, and that there's a lot of people who should be treated who aren't getting treated. So there are more of these, more of these kind of algorithms to help doctors uh, understand um, at what point to treat. And that's often the big question. At what point do I need treatment? Um, and we're seeing a movement also of people getting treated at lower viral loads. Um, when we compare this a little bit to in the, uh, in the old days of HIV, we only treated at a certain CD4 account and viral load, and now it's treat all for HIV. It's also treat all for Hep C. I don't think we're quite there yet or have the data for Hep B, but you definitely see people pushing and saying, you know what? Over 2,000, I treat, I don't care if they're antigen positive or antigen negative. We're waiting for more data. There's actually a study in um, Uzbekistan where they're treating all, and they're gonna look at the data for that um, in the next couple of years. So I always tell patients, keep track of your data. We have a little patient tracker for people, um, because as Joan was saying, you get a little fatigued, you're going to the doctor every six months, and they're not starting medicine. You at least keep track of your own data. And I've got patients with these beautiful spreadsheets um, and I think this is great, this is ideal, you know, you can track over time where your ALT is, and that's really important. Um, and then, uh, Dr. Patopoulos, I'm gonna 
So these are all the different guidelines. I'm curious what you as a hepatologist, there's the ASLD, the American Association of Study Liver Disease in the US. There's a um, easel, which is the European uh, one, and you can see that they're, you know, they're all similar, but um, it's a little bit different. Apostles, the Asian one, um, ATA is another group in the US, and they say anybody over, with any abnormal ALT, they don't say wait until they're over two times, um, and anybody over 2,000. Uh, easel and ASLD still use 20,000 um, for people with e-antigen. Um, so this, you can kind of see this similar themes, but definitely still differences amongst these different um, guidelines. So I'm curious how you approach that. Yes, uh, great. First of all, I would like to congratulate you because this is a wonderful gathering. And looks like people are learning from each other. It is very interactive, and this is something which is not very usual. The conferences are like monotone. One is talking and everybody else is listening. But you know, giving a team approach is excellent and fantastic. So a couple of comments. Whenever you see different guidelines, this means that there is no consensus. This means that the disease is perceived differently through different cultures, through different societies, and this is a problem. So, so what I say is that uh, the best guidelines are the ones that fit to my patient. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but I do not forget that uh, I was born in an area where hepatitis B is very endemic. So as you realize from my accent and my last name, I was born in Greece. And this is the Mediterranean area. And there are some epidemiologic pockets that you see the whole island infected by the disease because the dentist didn't clean the tools appropriately. Or something else happened, syringes and needles. So I'm really very sensitive. By the way, besides hepatitis B, we have hepatitis delta as well, which is a remnant of the virus infecting patients with hepatitis B. I like the European guidelines. And the European guidelines actually make some very nice distinctions. For example, carrier to me means an Air carrier means the postman, means somebody who's carrying something. <laughs> That's why the Europeans now, they don't say carrier, they say inactive hepatitis B, which is much more scientific to my understanding. So I'm not carrying tomatoes. And of course, you know, everybody's very sensitive with this because being a carrier or a healthy carrier that we used to say in the past does not give the impression, does not give the real meaning that you have inactive still hepatitis and this means that the virus is sitting in the liver and we need to monitor. Another component as you can see from this uh, actually is that the viral load, the threshold in order to treat is much less. It is 2,000 international units. It's not 20,000. In other words, we jumped again much faster because we truly believe, as you remember from previous publications, that the higher the viral load, the higher the likelihood for these patients to develop more scar tissue in the liver, and ultimately, as the years are passing by, we have so much scar tissue, and the liver looks like lumpy bumpy, and this is what cirrhosis is. Cirrhosis means that the liver looks lumpy bumpy, nothing else. And liver cancer. So these are my first two observations that I would like to share with you. I think the world is changing now. And of course, we need to adapt. I truly believe that elimination of viral hepatitis is a very hefty task, and it is difficult to be accomplished. 
And do you know why? Because there are new cases coming every day. And so far we're not able to identify the population and treat them appropriately. And of course when we are discussing elimination of viral hepatitis, it's not just in the United States. That's easy. Or that might be easier. There are areas in Africa, there are areas in South America, there are areas in East, Far East, that we need this kind of consideration. Treatment is very good in regards to controlling the disease. So the way I'm teaching my fellows is like this. So we have hepatitis C and we have hepatitis B. It's like you have two prisoners. The one is convicted, electric chair, you zap and boom, that's it. <laughs> that's hepatitis C. <laughs> hepatitis B, you put them in jail, but there is always some release <laughs> that they boom, escape. And this can happen very quickly. How? Because people are humans, besides the fact that they are patients. They forget the medication, they have socioeconomic issues, something else is happening and they don't take the medicine. Some other people are Googling now, you know, we have the Google doctor. This is giving you osteoporosis, you will have your bones cracked. Well, I'm not taking that. This is giving you upset stomach and there are some cancers in rats. Oh, I'm not taking that. So there are different things that they are coming down. Or they're getting confused because there are some herbs, herbal medication that has been advocated that can be very efficient against hepatitis B. And I still remember some of the medications, the herbs that we analyzed and guess what did we find? So they were getting the herbs, they were getting lamivudine, crushing it, sprinkling it, and giving it away. So there are so many stories around that we need to be very careful. But what is very appealing to me, and I see a very big turn, is not only immunotherapy, the way nicely you have described with uh, the PD, PDL1, and other things, is the fact that they can get some blood they can stimulate some of the cells that they are attacking the infected hepatocytes and they can kill the virus. I think this is very appealing. Having your own cells, recognizing much more effectively the infected hepatocytes and a new cure because this is what we need to target when we are discussing hepatitis B, the four letter word, and this is cure. Unfortunately, we are not able to achieve that in the majority of the population. We can do that, but the response rate is 10 to 15 percent. Sure. So. Currently, there are two main kind of medications, pills that people can utilize, and they are very effective. The one is Tenofovir, the other one is Enteca. But always I'm saying to the fellows, watch out, because the old interferon is still into play. You know, hepatitis B has different phases. It's not just one. And this is the genotypes, the way we say that. It's like there are different colors. Some of them respond better to some of the medications. For example, specific genotype like A can be treated with interferon, which is a very hard medication to give it to somebody. But if you, there is a young patient or a patient that wills to do that, injections are weak. Sometimes can take up to a year. Definitely, we need to give it to them. Now, for the second and third line of treatment, I said, do you see that? Forget about it. Because this kind of treatment is not the standard of care 
right now, and it is subpar. If you look at the depth of your data, you get the genotypic resistance of approximately 60% within five years. The same thing with lamivudine, lamivudine especially. Lamivudine helped us a lot. This is the medication that changed the world. I still remember the New England Journal of Medicine publication where people utilize lamivudine, and listen to this, the prevalence of liver cancer in kids decreased. I'm not talking about adults, I'm talking about kids. This is a paper came from Taiwan. And I was in the University of Miami where we transplanted actually this patient with viral hepatitis B and he had so bad relapse, we didn't know what to do. And my mentor back then called the pharmaceutical company and said, can you please give it to me? I know it's actually on trials, and they gave, gave it to us. And this patient was saved. So lots of things are coming, good things. Let's think positive. There is treatment, and we can control the disease, but we need to take it. Second key point, we need to check patients for liver cancer. That's extremely important. Even if the virus is under control, there is always something happening in the hepatocytes and can induce hepatocarcinogenesis. In other words, liver cancer. We need to keep an eye for fibrosis because patients with cirrhosis need to be checked all over for other things as well, osteoporosis, varices and stuff like that. And I would prefer you to see Sue, because if you see me, there's a problem. At this point, we need to exhaust all the options and move towards the last option, which is liver transplantation. It is extremely successful. The virus can come back in the post-transplant setting, and this is where we utilize this kind of medication, not interfere, or only and long sometimes with the hyperimmune gamma globulin try to block the entry of the virus in the liver cells. I'm not gonna take any more of your time, but I would be more than delighted to answer to any of your questions. So going to what you're saying, this is a um, very interesting what you're saying about life happens, right? And people we have all these amazing guidelines I just showed you and this is where we're talking about the medical conferences, um, and what's interesting is looking at what happens in real life. Okay, these are the gaps in care. So this was a CDC study, and they looked at um, four excellent healthcare systems. We all know Kaiser, we've heard of Geisinger, Henry Ford. These are all healthcare systems where it's very integrated. They have primary care docs, they have all the specialists you need. Um, and when, when they looked at Hep B patients, um, they were able to see that, you know, 78% of them had one ALT done. Um, so people go to the doctor, you do lab work, right? You might have a physical or whatever you go in for something you don't feel well to do. So the majority of people with HEP-B went to the doctor and 80% of them had blood work done, all right? Um, but when you want to look at HEP-B testing, only 37% had a HEP-B test done on average one, DN one per year. And 18% of these patients had never had a viral load. So what we're saying is that a majority of these patients um, despite coming in for other blood tests, such as the ALT, are not getting a viral load, um, and so we know that there are these gaps in coordination. Um, and you say, well, maybe these people don't have really active hepatitis, but they found that 32% of them were prescribed antiviral therapy. Um, and so, and so what you're saying, what you're seeing is that people are accessing care for other stuff, but not necessarily getting regular care for for hepatitis. And what I often will say to people is like, you know, we work closely with specialists. But we find that a lot of times people will go see a specialist once a year, and then they'll forget, and they'll not come back. And then unless the primary care doctor is like vigilant and says, oh, or we'll just say, you know what, I'm just gonna start testing you, um, then a lot of times people just fall through the cracks and they don't get their viral load. And you can imagine, if you're only getting your blood test every two years, and your viral load is um, you know, doing this, right? going up and down, your ALT is going up and down, there's a good chance you don't catch it unless you're doing your viral load and your ALT pretty regularly. I mean, some people really do need it every three to six months, not just six to 12 months. Um, and so what we think is probably happening, a lot of people are in those down periods when they see the doctor, don't get on medicine, and yet they're fluctuating, 
and having this ongoing inflammation, right? And then when they do show up with liver cancer, then you know, you know, it's a surprise to everybody. Unfortunately, hepatitis B is a disease that affects immigrants, especially. And you can see that people are coming and sometimes they don't have the appropriate resources. Mm -hmm. Or they see somebody and the linkage to care is not the best as well. So, and of course, you know, th things are falling through the cracks. So it's very important, as you say, to identify this population and go robust screening. All right, we want to take some questions. Does anybody Do you have, have something, we, uh, down, something written down? We'll take a look at it. Anybody else? No? Any questions that you guys have written down? want to talk about reactivation, we can talk about that. Sure. Why don't you ask, ask the question for Yes. Does the adult need a hepatitis B booster shot if they cut shots when they have kids? When they were kids. When they, they were kids already. Well, you know, if you look at the previous guidelines, it is ideal to check the level of the hepatitis B antibody that has already been produced at least every 15 to 20 years. And based on this, having a good idea. Some people say probably you don't need to do that because if you do this, you know, it's more confusion. The old schoolers say, no, I don't know what they think because there is always some risk. So there are two philosophies going on over there. Yeah, I mean, we are oftentimes, I get a lot of, um, college students coming back and they need it for because they're interning or something and so we do have to test and when they have the surface antibody negative we're stuck right because cdc says don't do it 95 percent of the people who've been vaccinated are immune but obviously if they're going to be at a healthcare facility we do need to do that booster if they're otherwise like low risk um we might just say you're probably immune if you were ever exposed you would be fine you would melt those antibodies and start producing them again it doesn't hurt if they get the boosters. It just doesn't hurt. Yeah. Is it just an economic decision then? Would yeah. insurance would insurance pay for? We booster? haven't had issues with yeah, yeah the booster getting paid yeah. for. S supposedly, if you need it, and there is a real exposure. You have already the memory that starts picking up, and of course, you know you will develop them. But you know, if you ask me, you know it's a little bit foggy. These are the guidelines. Am I testing myself? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're testing yourself. <laughs> Definitely. I would like to see what's going on. And, you know, I would like to see the titers. Well, let's see, you know, how effective this is. And, you know, sometimes this is very beneficial. Now, there's another question. What else a hepatitis B carrier needs to do other than six months blood work uh, monitor? I think this is the most important that they need to do. The other component that I would suggest is alcohol. I wouldn't have suggest alcohol consumption for somebody with inactive hepatitis B. And the new kid on the block now is fatty liver disease because fatty liver disease, which is the most common liver disease, believe it or not, is inducing an inflammatory component. It's hepatitis non-alcoholic induced steatic hepatitis. Non-alcohol because it's not alcohol, but the mechanism of damage is identical to those who consume alcohol. And if you look at my transplant list as we speak, it's not viral hepatitis anymore. You see that the hepatitis B has declined significantly, hepatitis C has declined significantly, and now you see alcoholic liver disease and the most common is fatty liver disease. People are coming with cirrhosis and complications. And what we see and what we discuss with our patients in the liver world is, it's better to have one strike on this liver if you have to have it. Because if you have two of them, the damage is attenuated. And you see more and more scar tissue developing and probably then one can activate the other one. So these are the two main things that I would suggest besides getting the test. Liver so cancer screening. You want to talk about liver cancer screening? Liver cancer screening, absolutely. This is the most important thing that needs to happen because we know the virus is carcinogenic. There are guidelines 
how to screen people and when. For example, if you have a man, Asian man above the age of 40, Asian women above the age of 50. In the past, we used to say people from Africa above the age of 20. Now the guidelines have dropped that and so on. These are the most important things. And the screening to be done, there is a misconception. People utilize alpha fetoprotein, which is a tumor marker. We know that the most effective way to be done is utilizing an ultrasound of the liver, not the blood test, because imaging is crucial. It's much more specific and more sensitive. If we tie that up along with the alpha fetoprotein, we have a better detection. So, and um, a question from a doctor. Uh, yeah, Dr. Chow. I know we probably answered this question before in our office, but when people were isolated kept E4, we still, uh, before we kind of discuss with Sue that uh, we choose not to vaccinate them with a booster, that's still the trend now? Sure. You know, this is an excellent question. And sometimes, you know, we have patients who are diabetic who technically. Uh, you know, have increased risk of uh, hep B infection, even though if they have an isolated hep B core, they were infected sometime in the past. Um, Absolutely right. And do you know, <coughs> uh, these are the extended criteria donors as well. So you have a 39 year old, for example, with a motor vehicle accident that comes back with B core positive only. Yes, we accept that, but we put these recipients lifelong treatment with for hepatitis B. Because, as you said, we're not sure if it is real elimination or clearance of the virus versus low bilinear lingering over there. Now, for these patients, it's good to keep an eye always we know that B core positivity might have an increased likelihood for carcinogenesis, and I'm checking them once in a while, but I'm not giving the booster as you said. Now, what's the best test to determine level of fibrosis cirrhosis? Liver biopsy, fiber scan, ultrasound, elastography, MRE, magnetic resonance elastography. I would say, all of the above. I don't know who wrote that, but you know, there is a pretty good insight. You know, of course, you know, I, I don't want somebody, I don't want to push the cold steel in somebody's liver. So liver biopsies are done less and less and less nowadays. But if you go, if I had to pick one of them, MRE, in other words, having an MRI done, you know, the thing that goes boom, 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 for a couple of hours, and now they give you some goggles and you see movies. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I see a very nice commercial in the lobby. Yes, they we have a big, yeah, we have some wow. really nice MRI machines. here, the Tesla 3 and so Tesla 1.5 or something. But is, that a, is that a different MRI machine? Well, so it's, a, it's an attachment. You buy oh, like the software the to the MRI for the, yes. to do the elastography part. We don't have it at this point. We only have ultrasound. So it's it? easy. No, we don't, we don't have, have it, but you know, MRE uh, it is probably the best because it checks the whole liver with the fiber scan. Of course, you have the probe that checks about one centimeter and extrapolates data that might represent the whole organ. But you know, this is the best. They need to look at the clinical trials. They prefer to utilize the MRE nowadays. But you know, it's not widely used, and there is a shortage for MRIs. For example, if I say to my uh, radiologist, can you please check and tell me how much fat is this? Is there in this liver? And at the same time, they say there is a trauma case with a broken head. <laughs> so it will be hard. Now, on an antiviral, how often should this be measured? I probably, uh, you mean the viral load or also? Like the fibrosis. How often do you measure fibrosis? With uh, a lot of these non-invasive or do you use blood tests ever? So I don't rely much in the liquid biopsies, which is the blood test. I would prefer to have a fibro scan done 
at least once a year or every two years, depending on what's the baseline. Yeah. For example, if I see a baseline of at least eight KPAs that we start thinking about advanced by process, I would like to have this repeated every one to two years. But here is the deal. We know from the registration files that people, and actually I have seen that when we started using that before. Mm -hmm. So patients were on the transplant list, started taking the medications, antivirals, the liver function improved, we delisted them, and a few years later, follow-up biopsies revealed resolution of the scar tissue, resolution of fibrosis. This is excellent, of course. So we say the patient is not consuming alcohol, and we don't have fatty liver disease anymore. But you know, if I say the AKPA, at least we go every one to two years, and there is another one. Oh, this is a good segue. Um, two questions. How do you how do you discover, how do you diagnose fatty liver and how do you treat fatty liver disease? Okay, that's uh, this is a specialty of his. He has a number of clinical trials with fatty liver. This is very interesting because this is a new kid on the block and you know I'm running approximately twenty-five clinical trials. Fatty liver disease is the most common liver disease. And this has to deal with metabolic risk syndrome diabetes, three quarter of the diabetic population suffer from fatty liver. This lipidemia, high triglycerides, high cholesterol, thyroid diseases, obesity is extremely important, obesity, and also sedentary life. In other words, the way I'm looking at my kids now, sitting on the couch playing with the video games, I'm saying, no, no, you go outside. <laughs> That's it, old style. Also, what do we eat? Having said that, we need to rule out, we need to exclude a very important factor, which is the one? Alcohol consumption. Because if the patient comes in and says, you know, I suffer from diabetes, this and that, but at the same time, I'm having three, four drinks every day, you know, probably this is not non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, is both, but alcoholic and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And also there are some medications, as we know, that can induce fatty liver disease. For example, amiodarone, some of the uh, medications for psoriasis. So we need to review thoroughly the chart of the patient. And lastly, there are some metabolic syndromes that we need to exclude that they induce fatty liver disease. How do we diagnose fatty liver disease? So there are two stages that we need to diagnose. First of all is fatty deposition in the liver. How do we do that? An ultrasound can tell us if there is fat in the liver. The second component is we need blood work and see is this non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or NASH, non-alcoholic steatose hepatitis, because the first one is much easier to be handled, there is no much of inflammation happening in the liver. But if you see the liver enzymes creeping up, this means that the patient suffers from hepatitis. You know, hepatitis is inflammation of the liver. And there are different kinds of hepatitis. Viral hepatitis, alcoholic hepatitis, autoimmune hepatitis, or NASH, non-alcoholic steatose hepatitis. How do we treat that? First of all, managing the underlying disease. This is cardinal. If there is a medication, we need to stop it. If there is diabetes not under control, not well controlled, we need tight control of the disease. If there is this lipidemia, we need to increase whatever we give to the patients. Second, that's the most difficult to treat. Why? So the patient comes in, I say, you know, Probably we need to cut down with the calories. Uh-huh, uh-huh. We need to start exercising. Uh-huh, uh-huh. 30, 45 minutes per day. Uh-huh. Please don't drink. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Do you have any pills? I don't have time for stuff yeah. like that. <laughs> so this is what is coming down. I say, you know, listen, you know, I'm working 14-hour shifts. So I don't have time, you know, to go to the gym, and I'm exhausted. So, and I understand. But, even a 5% decrease of the body weight 
is being associated with normalization of the liver enzymes. And at least seven to 10% decrease of the body weight is being associated with resolution of scar tissue in the liver. I think this is very important. What else can we do? For non-diabetics, vitamin E is being utilized 400 international units, one in the morning, one in the night. But vitamin E has been associated with cardioembolic, prostate cancer, and other things. So people are a little bit reluctant with the vitamin E nowadays. What else can we utilize? If the patient is on medication for diabetes, probably we can change the diabetic regimen and include some of the SPTs SP and all of these things that have been associated with body weight reduction. This is the area currently in hepatology, in liver disease, that all the pharma is zooming down. I'm not kidding. There are so many trials. And by the way, all of them have failed. So far, there is only one compound that has been associated with some good results. Am I talking too much? Yeah. Are you sure? I mean, this is a question, but if we have other questions, raise your hand and Gene will grab the, um, your notes. So the best thing is to decrease the body weight and modify the diet. I think what's interesting about the fatty liver is because our hep B patients are getting ultrasounds every year, we are diagnosing right. it much more in the hep B patients than I think my general population because they're getting pictures, they're getting the imaging every year um, or six months. And um, but oftentimes how we find it and what people you know it's often from elevation of liver enzymes. If their ALT is just a little bit high, but I think that's the most common presentation is we're trying to figure out why the ALT is a little bit high. Um, and we might do an imaging, we might, do, we might screen out everything, all the have viral hepatitis, autoimmune, um, you know, we'll whatever, look for everything else, we find nothing else, and we'll do like a, a fiber short test, which isn't great, but, you know, we'll say, oh, it looks like it might be that. So, Dr. Chow? So, uh, so the use of weight loss medications like eusemia, I guess fatty liver will be another indication on top of, you know, sleep apnea and diabetes and hypertension, right? Like you would be working, for example, in a weight loss clinic to uh, Excellent point. metabolic syndrome. You know, stuff Excellent like that. point. This is, you know, the bariatric centers now. Where they are getting removed by the horns. And, you know, that's very important because the bariatric surgeons, in approximately 25% of the cases, were not able to carry on. They were finding cirrhosis. And you cannot do any kind of bariatric surgery for patients with cirrhosis and diabetes. And oftentimes the patient is obese and then they have knee problems and can't exercise, even though ideally they should be cycle. Yep. So this is with the vicious circle now that we are getting, and understandable. But you know, when it comes down to this, here is the way I'm approaching it. Of course, when you say, can I exercise? Like you cannot tell them, okay, get out there and run the marathon. <laughs> so what I'm telling them is this, there are public gyms, or if you are, can afford, go to the gym, sit down with one of the trainers once, and ask them to formulate a schedule for you. Of course, they will ask you, do you have shoulder pain, do you have elbow, hip pain? And they will tell you how to exercise and what to do. Otherwise, it's futile. I don't want anybody to go on the treadmill and having a heart attack, and after I say, oh, you told me that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have one more question from Joan, and then we'll wrap up. Oh, maybe two? Okay. Uh, yes, uh, the question is, uh, if you are a carrier or uh, have the uh, hepatitis B, and sometimes you have other uh, medical situations when we are having a cold, you want to take medicine, and if you reach a side effect, you always say that it has potential damage to your liver. So in that case, how do you do the judgment if you should take that medicine or not? Well, you know, if you behave like everybody else, because the likelihood is equivalent. I mean, you know, for example, people have the misconception with uh, acetaminophen, Tylenol, mm -hmm. which is one of the best analgesics. So the main component is don't overdo it. Yeah. 
For example, you don't need to taste a whole bottle within 24 hours in order to better, because this has happened. You know, somebody had the Tylenol by the side in whiskey, and they were alternating. <laughs> and you know, we have seen patients that are coming with Tylenol overdose. These are real things. So just try to stay less than two grams per day, which is four extra strength per day, which is a pretty good dose, actually. It's every six hours. So, just normal. Okay. I always tell people to check with your doctor, too, yeah. um, to see, because, yeah, if you look at the, if you look at the inserts, everything's, all, it's always liver, potential liver damage, so it can be scary for patients, but there are a lot of medicines that are fine. All right, Joan, final question. Final question is, so <coughs> fatty liver disease, particularly in the Asian community, is, it's more in the lean fatty liver disease. Now, I can, I can afford to lose 10% of my weight, but I mean, for a lot of, I don't understand why the Asian Americans are at such increased risk when most don't have obesity problems. Here is the deal. What makes the difference is the deposition of the fat. So, and take a look at the sumo players. The sumo players are, you know, 400 pounds. They don't have any evidence of fatty liver disease. Everything is outside. <laughs> because the difference is, if you try to get a CAT scan and see the intra-abdominal deposition of fat, this is what makes the difference. It's not how much you have outside, it's what's happening in the abdomen. And of course, the lean type of fatty liver disease is a real entity, and we know about that. This is when we check CAT scans and MRIs and other things to see what's happening on that. Well, why, why are we getting it in our intra-abdominal? So this is the different genetic factors that may play a role. Diet, because different cultures have a different way of cooking and eating different ingredients. And how, you know, the metabolic pathway is happening. I think um, Hispanics also, right, have a mutation that also predisposes them to fatty liver. So the genetic factors are real. For example, the PNA. P3, pimple 3 is the gene that has been associated with fatty liver disease. And we know that. But you know, diet is very important. And take a look at that. For example, if you have somebody, let me use in Europe, that gives a certain type of diet. For example, I'm Greek, and what's the most common kind of diet? A Mediterranean diet. After I met my wife, I'm eating spaghetti and pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I still remember the first time I went to the restaurant over here. I remember my friends took me to one of the restaurants, and you know, when I, I was off the boat, and I order, I think you've got to be kidding me. This is, you know, the food for the whole week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <In one> city. <laughs> so, you know, you see that culture started adjusting. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. All right, everybody, Jean is reminding us, please fill out your questionnaire uh, on your survey um, because it's really important for us to know what you thought of it, what you would like, if you think this is something useful, something we should do next year. When well, we posted about this conference on the heavy listserv, we had people say, when are you going to do one in California, in San Jose? And we said, well, this is really the first time that we're very disappointed you're not doing this in California. So, well, you know, maybe if there's funding and resources and all that. Um, so it's important for us to know, you know, what you guys think. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing Thank you all for coming from Doylestown and PA. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Thank you. Does anybody need a pen? I got a Thank you very much. I enjoyed those. Thank you so much. John, let's take a picture with the team. Oh, I'm sure it's that part of Let's see who else is here. Looks like everyone's taking a test now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Prasopoulos. Thank you. We actually so have a we have a gift for you. This is a, oh. Tim can tell you more about this. This is a micrograph of the famous bee bottles. <laughs> it looks like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you see it. <laughs> it looks the like paisley. Like like mm -hmm. Yeah. Good.
It could be. I mean, it actually was. Do you guys want something to write on? I mean, it on. No, this is excellent. Thank yeah, you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank well, you. thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to get a picture of this. But that it actually is from the yeah, uh, 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 Kornberg and Menford days. No, I just. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Would you like a pad of paper? Nice to meet you. Thank you very much. So is this actually related to the Blumberg? Yeah, the Blumberg is our research institute. So it's the famous Blumberg. Yes, Barry Blumberg. He, he was a mentor to uh, Tim for many years, and um, he actually worked at um, the Blumberg Institute a couple days a week before he yeah. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you very much. There we go. It was a pleasure. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Your presentation was great. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I get this back? Absolutely. Absolutely.